Let's see. Uh, where should we start? Where should we start? Oh, okay. So I'm going to start at a, a place near and dear to my heart. Why does Verizon own TechCrunch? I think that if you think about where this world is going with content, and I pride, Verizon pride ourselves to have the best network, but the bonus was on top of the network is all the content we're doing, and especially mobile. And I think that's where it fits in the whole Verizon Media Group and what TechCrunch is doing, what Huffington Post is doing, what Yahoo Mail is doing, and all of that. That's over the top for us. And when I think about 5G, which I hope we will come to, it's a totally new way to actually communicate with the consumers uh, when it comes to content. And having that in-house, I think, is just amazing for us to learn. But not only that, I mean, if you think about the whole Verizon Media Group, AI, ML competences in a carrier company, mm -hmm. that's very unique. I would say we are the only carrier, if you call us a carrier, in the world that's AI and ML in-house. And uh, the network is going virtual. I mean, so we're virtualizing the network within all those type of forces and those great, uh, great competences. So it makes sense for many reasons to, to have that inside in order to be uh, um, even stronger for our consumers. Mm -hmm. And so why, why is the media group such a good test bed for something like 5G? I so said 5G, if I can just pull back, I mean 5G, which when we talk about 5G, we think it's a 4G next step. It's not. 2G to 4G uh, was based on two parameters. Speed and throughput improved tremendously in between them. Mm -hmm. You took your phone for doing SMS and voice, and then you can uh, browse any type of, uh, of online uh, in 4G. 5G... When the start of the design on 5G, the thinking was, how do we transform enterprises and society wirelessly? That was the idea. Of course, there's going to be a lot of benefits for consumers. And 5G has eight currencies, not two. Mm -hmm. So throughputs and speeds are exponentially much faster. I mean, we, we see already right now on a smartphone, two, three gig on a smartphone. A couple of years from now, it's going to be 10 gig on a phone uh, easily. The, 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 the throughput is enormous. The latency, which hasn't been that important on 4G, right. we're going to design down to 10 milliseconds. And today on the 4G network, I would say it's 80, 90, maybe 100 milliseconds. Sure. And 10 milliseconds is like fast touch, right? Uh, like that's as fast it's, as touch. Yeah, you, you can do things real time that you have never been able to do before. So, and then battery lifetime, only a tenth of what we use today in 5G. But more important, there are also service provisioning, meaning doing slices of the network. If I should do a slice of our 4G network today, it would take us a couple of weeks if I do that for a, a customer, say, hey, I want my 4G network. And say, right. We should be down to 90 minutes to do slices of the network. Uh, the other thing that we always do is all the speed and the mobility speed, meaning that we can capture a signal up to 500 kilometers per hour in 5G. And then you ask me, why do you need that? Yeah, you have drones, yeah. you have high-speed trains, which we today we cannot, cannot uh, sort of capture when, when we have a 4G signal. So all these eight currencies are actually a totally new testbed uh, and platform for doing new type of businesses. It's dramatically dis different from anything else you have seen from 4G. Still, there's going to be a lot of great things for consumers uh, and all these car uh, currencies, but it's also going to be much wider, this impact. I see this as a leapfrog, a quantum leap compared to 4G. And when you're, when you're talking about the 5G implementation of Verizon specifically, what's the difference in, in rollout and in technology and implementation on the ground versus a competitor like AT&T? I think that, uh, first of all, you only build the eight currencies if you have customers that are going to use them. So let's assume I'm in a European carrier only having consumers. I, I wouldn't build it as I build right now. Uh -huh. We build fiber in over 60 cities today. We're going to have fiber to every radio base station because we're going to have so much data. Uh, we're basically going to build for all these eight currencies with the throughput speed, the low latency, and all of that. And uh, so that's different for, uh, from anybody else. I, I, I don't know what AT&T is doing, to be honest, uh, or at least I cannot talk about it. Uh, <laughs> so, I think that, so I think that, that that's a big difference for us, how we're going to build the network. And you should understand, we have four business cases on the same infrastructure, which is important for this audience. Number one, the cost per bit is going down with every technology. Right. That is the 3D to 4D as well. Then the mobility case, you're going to go around with a, smart, a smartphone with 5G. We have launched 13 cities, 13 NFL stadiums, 
and the MBA season haven't even started. So that's the mobility case. We continue to broaden that. Uh, then we're 5G home. We're actually going to, instead of having a fiber to the home, we're 5G from the, from the edge to the home, and you can have the same experience. We have that in four cities today. We're going to have more uh, later this year. And ultimately, the third, fourth business case is the 5G mobile edge compute. That's basically when you bring all these currencies or these capabilities of 5G to the edge of the network. So you can have this throughput, which is enormous, and the speeds of the 10 gig, I'm not sure, could be even higher, uh, as well as the latest down 10 milliseconds. And you started doing applications at the edge for consumers, for enterprises, and sure. society on, on device A and ML that can uh, transmit faster. Absolutely. Back I mean, to the base if you want to uh, load softwares on top of the mobile edge compute, like AI, etc., so sure. you can so do a lot of processing at the edge. Uh, that's a, a typical use case. Uh, how you would do it? I mean, think about the factory, for example, with robotics in it. Instead of having wires to everything, you basically do a 5G factory, and all the robots can be reconfigured in seconds, and you have milliseconds of latency to them. So suddenly, you need to rethink the whole way you have done your infrastructure from the beginning. So when Verizon's doing rollout of 5G, as it's in the process of doing right now, one of the things I think is that it's important to see when you look at the rollout of 3G and then 4G is how it often rolled out in areas that were, frankly, richer and whiter than a lot of other areas first because they felt, oh, we have the customer base here, we can sell to these customers, we know that they'll be available. Is Verizon doing work to make sure basically that, that 5G technology is available on a unilateral basis versus a socioeconomic basis that tends to favor a certain group of people? Absolutely. Uh Two of the cities of the 13 that we have uh, launched so far, two of them are very rural. Uh, on Saturday evening, uh, I announced together with Farrell Williams that we're going to uh, going to put 5G in 100 schools the next three years. So we're really trying to bring out 5G in the most underserved markets as well, uh, especially when it comes to uh, sort of clusters of schools and things like that when 5G is. Remember also, we. We, we, we start to deploying our 5G on millimeter wave spectrum, which has an enormous throughput and speed, uh, but of course not as wide for coverage. Right. We're going to use other spectrums for that. So clearly, we, we see any uh, sort of uh, place where it's a cluster of, of a lot of people, etc. That's the sweet spot for millimeter wave right now. Uh, but ultimately, any spectrum we would have would be a 5G spectrum, as any spectrum today is a 4G spectrum. It's just the maturity of the industry, the devices, uh, whatever you're connecting to. Okay. Um, I actually have an interesting question about, so the industry at large is kind of doing, well, the tech industry, especially big tech, has this sort of navel-gazing thing going on as far as regulation goes. So as a CEO of a telecom company, one of the most regulated sectors in business, really, how do you feel about big tech getting more scrutiny from regulatory organizations? I think that, first of all, I mean, uh, technology is evolving extremely fast all the time. And, and, uh, uh, and, and to regulate it too much, you would also cap technology enormously. You need to find a balance of light touch and corporate responsibility. Because to be honest, one of the best technologies in the world is the mobility broadband and cloud. Any sustainable, scal scalable solution in the world right now to address uh, the biggest challenges on, on Earth we have. Education, healthcare, uh, inequalities. Then you have these three technologies, and they evolve fantastically. There's a lot of developers, platform uh, delivers uh, companies. So for me, it's, it, can, it has to be light touch because ultimate technology is moving so fast to regulate it today when people are working on what's going to happen in five years. That balance, but ultimately it also comes down to guys like me running big tech companies, that we are responsible also how this impacts society and having a, a wider responsibility than we have ever had before. So, and I think we're going to be judged on it as well. I mean, how, how well we do that. I mean, we have 120 million uh, wireless consumers in, in, in this country. I mean, they're going to judge us if we do stupid things. So I think that balance uh, is how it has to be struck. But I'm not a genius on doing uh, regulation, etc. But I think that's because you don't want to hamper the technology evolution that is so impo important for this planet. I mean, I, I just came out from the UN week uh, talking about all these 17 sustainable development goals, how we're going to achieve them in the whole world. And to be honest, 
if it's not technology is going to help them, I'm not sure how we're going to do it. Right. Technology has to be there. And so would you vote for Elizabeth Warren, even if she's very, very regulatory uh, heavy? So, uh, uh, remember, I'm Swedish. Sure. Yeah, so I'm not voting in this country. <laughs> that's, a very, that's a great out. I did say, would you, not are you, but, uh, uh, you, you know, I get uh, it. You, I, you heard my answer. <laughs> um, okay, so do you think that there is a, there's a, val a validity to a company like Huawei being under so much scrutiny for the, the uh, communications equipment it's providing the country? Do you think it's right to ban Huawei from, from selling communications equipment in the U.S.? I don't have insights to that, so I cannot even answer on it. I think it's important in general. I think that 5G, 6G need to have a flourish sort of supply chain with many suppliers. That's going to be important. But one thing that I think that people underestimate uh, when it comes to the telecom industry is that it's a reason why all your phones that you have in this room actually works in any country in the world. Because you share patterns in the industry. The smartest patterns, so when the eight currencies was decided as this is a standard for 5G, all the tech companies in the telecom sector, they throw in, this is the best pattern to solve it. And finally, say, these are the patterns we're going to use to build it. Now everyone can build. So if you're in the pharmaceutical industry, if you have a pattern, the last thing you do is to share with your competitors. This industry, you share with competitors and then you build. And that's why this industry is so critically important. And that's why so many people on this earth actually have a phone in their hands. So that's important. You have many people actually working with it. So uh, from that point of view. Got it. Um, I think that one of the things that the people in this audience especially are most interested in is, you know, I think you talk a lot about 5G for the enterprise um, and the opportunities down the line. But what are some of the near-term practical ways that you think 5G will actually benefit a very young company? Let's say a company under 100 people that's just getting off the ground. How are they best to prepare themselves for this and would utilize it? I, I remember I got a lot of questions on stage when 4G was coming, you know, oh, what, what app's going to be on 4G? And I missed it totally how much would happen in this uh, region of the world, how much innovation it was on top of 4G. I see that the 5G platform is even more open and having even more opportunities. So I think that uh, what companies like uh, we are doing, we have our test beds, we have four uh, or five innovation centers across the country where you can actually elaborate with 5G already. Uh, we had our 5G challenge, we have hundreds of companies coming up with ideas. Um, the 5G mobile edge compute. We have said publicly, we're going to launch the first 5G mobile edge compute centers in Q4 this year. That means that then you're going to see even more opportunities to start to innovate on top of the 5G, uh, 5G mobile edge compute. So I have to come back a little bit on exactly, but I think that you need to start thinking about how you can innovate for consumers, enterprise, society on that platform with those enormously uh, capable currencies that we have in 5G. Um, the, to bring it back to the, the media thing, I mean, the, the ap approach of Ryzen in the media business is, definitely seems to be more light touch than somebody like AT&T, who's going very heavy, they've obviously bought a broadcaster and that sort of thing. Uh, why do you think that it, your approach is different? I'm not sure my approach is different. This is our strategy. You build the strategy on the, what you think is the best assets of the company and the DNA of the company. Um, others might have other DNA and other assets and they build on that. I think that the strength of Verizon is actually our network. I mean, our 3D network, 4D network has always been the best in the market. We're going to continue to have the best coverage and the best throughputs. And we think uh, our customers, if they're enterprise customers, consumers, uh, small and medium business customers, government, whoever, they, pro they actually are together with Verizon because we have the best network. That's why we have a network as a service model. We basically build one network now. We have redesigned the whole network topo topography in order to see that at the edge, we decide what type of access we're gi giving that customer. Some get 5G, some got 4G, some has a fiber, some might have even a copper. We just see that we're going to get optionality. That goes for our customer of broadband as well. We give them optionality. You can choose YouTube TV or you can use uh, choose Fios, whatever. We want to give optionality for our customer on a very strong base on the network. And do you think, what in, in five years, what do you think the business mix of Verizon looks like? Is 5G the pillar that you're resting on in five years? <laughs> Externally estimates says that by 2024, 
external not Verizons, that roughly 50% of the US population will have a 5G phone. So it just showed the same thing we saw between 3G and 4G. You need to keep 4G for a long, long time. And I think that we're going to see 4G continue to live for a long, long time, and we are continuing to invest heavily in, in the network of 4G as well. And so I think that we're going to see an incremental revenue over time, and we have said to the market that 2021, we will see some impacts from 5G home and 5G mobility, and 2022 from 5G mobile edge compute. That's what we have said to the market. Uh, so 4G will continue to be important. I mean, we, we invest 17 to 18 billion US dollars every year in network. Uh, that's how important we think the network is. Mm -hmm. And with the millimeter wave technology that you're using, that, that um, investment has to go up, right, over the next couple of years? Yeah, so remember, uh, we started with millimeter wave four or five years ago. And to be honest, when you build a network, it's a lot of stuff that you need to invest in way before you come to the radio base station, which is, a, is one piece of it, but not all of it. So sort of the, the part that people see. Yeah, the, yeah, but the fiber investment that we've been ongoing uh, uh, for a while, you know, we do 1,400 route miles of fiber every month right now. In, in this country, and I don't think that anybody's even close to build as much fiber as Verizon is doing this moment. So there's a lot of other stuff that we're already doing that is embedded in actually the delivery of a 5G experience. You need all the way from the data center, all the way out to the consumer or the enterprise receiving the 5G signal is a lot of investment. We can do basically all investment from the data center up to the access, and we're already doing them. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's not yet to my house, so I'll give you my address after this. <laughs> Maybe we can fast track that. Uh, I'm pretty hungry that. for yeah, it. Yeah, for perfect. Um, okay, excellent. So the, I think that the, um, the, the last question I have is, what, what do you think the competitive advantages to somebody building a company now um, are in the next, let's call it two years, if they wanted to build out a particular feature set that you thought would benefit the most from 5G, would it be... Uh, a compute-heavy, localized service? Would it be sending large amounts of data? Like, what customers are going to benefit the most? I think that uh, if I would be thinking about it and having clean slate, I would think a lot about what you will have in the mobile edge compute. Because you're going to have storage, compute uh, uh, in that. So you can actually rethink the whole idea that you need to have that either for, for up in the network, in the data centers, or in the device, whatever device. Sometimes we lock ourselves at a, as a phone. There are so many other devices that, uh, that is connected. So I think that will start rethinking how do you build a new, I mean, I mean, just assume video cameras, for example. At the cost of a video camera, they have a lot of uh, compute and storage in the cameras today because of the latency and all of that. Uh, just imagine you can take out that, you put it into the network instead. What can you do with it? And how can you change the perception? How can you do a service on that? I, I, that's where I really would uh, like to think about it. But the good thing, there are thousands of people that, that are <laughs> far more smarter than me that are going to see what they can transform. And as I said, I, mean, I think 4G was just dramatic when it comes to innovation on the network. 5G is an even m superior platform for innovation because it has so much more uh, currencies that you can actually build a business on. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Hans. I appreciate it, sir. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you all. I need to come up here.